town may be kind of small, but these folks have big smiles and big hearts. And they know what it is to have simple fun down our way. For old-fashioned singing and homey gatherings make living mighty pleasant. And I've offered to mentor people, but no one ever seems to take me up on it. Maybe because I'm such a fucking know-it-all. <laughs> <laughs> that might have something to do with it, but who knows? Dave's rolling. Welcome to Abandoned Albums, the documentary podcast where we take a closer look at some albums that may have been forgotten about over time and some albums you might not even know existed. I'm your host, Keith R. Higgins. Rob Janicki is off this week. And this is my husband. How do you do? Francis, I demand that you stop this display and come home. Get away from this man. Yeah, really, I, I can't make it alone. You don't mind, Lane? Oh, no, Vance. If you like, I'll walk in front of you with trumpets. I warn you, Francis, someday you'll go too far. This is part two of our interview with the godfather of outsider music, Erwin Schusett. Now, while you don't need to have heard part one to follow along in part two, part one does provide a little bit more context to part two, so I encourage you to go back and listen to part one before listening to part two. I don't feel turdy. I brought my pencil. Give me something to write on, dude. In this episode, Irwin gives us the lowdown on music rights and who owns what. He's got a great story about Lizzo. He's got a great story about Lady Gaga. And he also tells us about how he became affiliated with Sun Ra, which is a story deeply entrenched in the worst aspects of the music business. And all three stories are told as only Irwin could tell them. So here's part two of our conversation with Irwin Chusid. What got you to FMU? Like, how did you um, get into the radio <laughs> gig? You know, I've always been a radio Adam. Uh, I mean, well, I watched TV when I was young, but I was really fascinated i had a connection with radio back oh my god it's my earliest childhood just something about it of of hearing this sounds come out of a little box but no pictures there was something that stimulated the imagination but radio to me was something i was fascinated by it was intrigued by and when i went away to college uh in 1969 i was at University of Bridgeport for two years, two pivotal years that convinced me once and for all, I never want to go back to college. I hung around WPKN, which was a free form radio station yep. back then in Bridgeport. Yep. And, but I was really working on the college newspaper, the Scribe. I was one of the editors and I really wanted to be a writer. Fascinated as I was by radio and I had a lot of friends on the radio station. I'd hang around there, but I never really thought I could do a radio show. I, part of me was too shy. When I quit college, I spent a few years just kicking around, and the world became my, my school, and has been ever since. And I spent a few years kicking around, doing odd jobs. At a certain point, I found myself living at a house in the country with a bunch of other hippies, and I had a lot of free time on my hands, and I started listening to WFMU, which I knew about as having been a freeform station in 1969, and of course I had a freeform experience uh, exposure at University of Bridgeport with WPKN, but what I was hearing on WFMU in 1974 was not freeform. I had met the station manager, Bruce Longstreet, um, through a circuitous series of events having to do with a newspaper gig I had in February, January or February 75, and told Bruce Longstreet, I want to do a radio show. And he said, well, sure, why not? <laughs> he knew who I was. He liked me. And he said, yeah, and I do an audition tape. I did an audition tape. He said, fine, you're on the air. And I just never left. I can tell you I don't have money, but what I do have are a very particular set of skills, skills I've acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. I was the outsider music guy. I was the Langley guy. I was the Esquivel guy. I was the Raymond Scott guy. And because FMU at that point was on the internet, we've been on the web since 95. 
I was also much better known as a WFMU radio host. The next thing would have been Jim Flora. Um, I had discovered Jim Flora's album covers, jimflora.com, and you can see the art, and you'll understand why I'm excited about it. Um, there's something very cartoonish about it, something a little primitive, something colorful, something bizarre. Uh, there was just a lot of things about Jim Flora's art that I just got excited about. But at the time, all I knew was his album covers, which he had done for Columbia Records in the 1940s and RCA Victor in the 50s, and no nothing after. Through a friend, J.D. King, um, I was introduced to Flora and went to visit him in Connecticut in 1998. He, he had been diagnosed with terminal cancer, stomach cancer. He was 84. I went to visit him. I was just about to set up a website for his album covers, and he never lived to see it. But he did lend me a few of his covers that I didn't have, and he gave me some duplicates. So I was starting to amass my collection of Jim Flora album covers. Eventually, I had accumulated enough of Flora's album covers and art that he had done when he was at Columbia Records in the 1940s, promotional and commercial art and other odds and ends that I was able to put a book together in 2004 called The Mischievous Art of Jim Flora. Very nice. And it's full of album covers that he did. Whether you knew who these artists were or not, it didn't matter. And it was around 2005 that I found out that the Flora family, his four surviving children, had a storage locker full of Jim's fine art Whoa. that had never been seen and it was more bizarre than his album covers so with that and my partner barbara economan who is a digital media specialist at the walker art center in minneapolis okay um we put together second book curiously sinister art of jim flora which has just all kinds of strange art and eventually a third, and eventually a fourth. And we started issuing fine art prints. We licensed some of his images for uh, jigsaw puzzles and T-shirts and all kinds of things. Flora has just added such a great visual dimension to my life. And of course, it attracted its own cult following. It's a brand, but it's a limited brand, Jim Flora. Okay. But I then became, I was the Jim Flora guy. At heart, I'm not a nostalgia guy. Okay. I wanted people to take Flora's art. Put it on new album covers. If you're going to change the colors, that's fine. Adapt it. Because what I want to do is reinvent it. I want to make it something current. So with Raymond Scott, I put together a band called the Raymond Scott Orchestra. Uh, it's a seven-piece band. And each one of them is a unique musician. And when I got them together, I said, here's all the Raymond Scott music. Pick the ones you want to do, but do not copy Raymond's arrangements. Make them something new, make them different, make them something modern. And they did that. I wanted people to perform Esquivel's music, but to re, re envision it. stuff to be alive i want this stuff to be current i do not want it to be a museum i want it to be something that has uh, uh, an extended life into the 21st century and that in the course of doing that of course that's often how i pay my bills 
sure. by being able to license material out that I control. Somebody else might say, I just discovered this great artist. I'll do a book and I'll do an exhibit and I'll go out and talk about it. And that's it. I try to find out if there are rights issues. In all the realm of crime and crime detection, in all the history of murder, mystery, intrigue, the master of them all, Philo Vance. Tonight, the case of strange music. But first... Somebody writes a song. Okay. And then they record it. Well, the person that wrote the song is a writer. Simple as that. Could be two. Could be three. Could be a group. But whatever. But someone had to write the song. That's called the composition. And then that composition is going to have a publisher. That's the business end of it. The writer is the creative. Publisher is the business. So you've got the writer and you've got the publisher. That's one side. On the other side, you have a recording. Well, someone made that recording. An artist. A solo artist. A band. Whatever. So you've got the artist. And then you've got the owner of the recording. Could be a record label. Could be the artist. Okay? You, these, here's these four rights. If someone writes a song and then records it themselves, and then they're their own publisher, and then they release it on their own label, one person controls all four components of the rights. That's rare. Interesting. So those are the four sets of rights. Now, how they generate revenue besides licensing uh, through performance rights societies like ASCAP, mm -hmm. BMI, Canadian Music Rights Association or something. Um, there's all these different performing rights societies that you have to register with and then hope that they generate some money. Um, and you got to be prepared, even with big catalogs, that a lot of the stuff you control doesn't generate much money. It's nickels and dimes. With Sun Ra, the nickels and dimes add up because it's such a huge catalog. Same with Raymond Scott. Esquivel does not have a lot of compositions, unfortunately. And I don't control any of them. You've heard of Lizzo. Absolutely. Yep. In a minute, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, yes. Whatever. So yeah. I didn't know who she was. I don't follow hip hop. And I, you know, at the time, this would have been three or four years ago. I was approached by someone who said, um, we have this uh, artist, Lizzo, and she wants to sample a Raymond Scott recording. The recording by Raymond Scott is called Nescafe. We control the publishing and we control the recording. By the way, the recording is referred to as the master. Because when they used to make records in the old days, there was a master, which was a negative image of the, the grooves of a record. And you'd stamp, a, you know, a platter of, you know, hot liquid vinyl or whatever and make a record. So the master is, is the recording and we also control the publishing. And they wanted to use this uh, recording in a piece called Tempo. And they wanted to license it. So they sent me the recording of Tempo, and it didn't really mean much to me. I just thought, I don't think Raymond's family is going to like it. Um, the version that I heard had the F word in it like, I don't know, 60 times. And I just thought, I don't think Raymond would like this. So I spoke to uh, the family, and I said, you know what, let's, let's just say no to this. I, so I don't feel, something does not feel comfortable about it. So I told the company that had been inquiring that I think we're going to pass on this. And they said, um, really? Well, we really think you should do this. Um, we really like the song and want to do this. And at that point, I just wanted them to go away. So I just said off the top of my head, I, okay, we want 50% of the publishing and we want 50% of the master revenue. Wow. I think they were probably prepared to offer between 10 and 25%. And I just figured, I'm, I'm going to ask for 50 because I know they're not going to do it, and then they'll leave me alone. They called me back in a week and said they would agree to 50%. I thought, okay, sure, why not? Of course, from that point on, when I mentioned to people, you, want, you got a sample on New Lizard record? And then the license inquiry started coming in, and we control half the publishing on it. Uh, that thing made a lot of money for the Scott family. 
it's still making a lot of money for the Scott family. Good. And I'm looking back and thinking, wow, I was prepared to walk away from that and just leave it on the table and say, I'm sorry, we don't want to do that. Was that a bad business decision? It makes me look like I'm a really tough negotiator. I'd say I got lucky in this case because they could have said no. Right, right. They could have said 25%. It's going to make you a lot of money. Please do it. And I might have said, nah, okay. But I, for some reason, some stubborn part of me just didn't see the possibilities in it. And we lucked out. That doesn't happen often. Generally speaking, with artists, you're going to get 10, 15 percent when they sample something that you own. I've been waiting for this one. Turn it up. Slow songs, they for skinny hoes. Can't move all of this here to one of those. I'm a thick bitch, I need tempo. tempo. Fuck it up to the tempo. Pity pat, pity pat, pity pity pat. pat. Look at my ass, it's fitty, fitty fat. Pat. Kitty cat, kitty cat, kitty kitty cat. cat. Pour me a glass, boy, I like my water wet. What? Throw it back. Throw it back. Good, good. Catch that. Get that, get that. I need a jack Woo. for all of this ass, but it won't go flat. Baby, 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 come eat some of this cake. Yeah. He look like he could gain a little weight. Yeah. Lick the icing off, put the rest in your face. Yeah. Slow songs, they for skinny hoes. Can't move all of this here to one of those. Hey. I'm a thick bitch, I need tempo. Yeah. Fuck it up to the tempo. Fuck it up to the tempo. Fuck it up to the tempo. Slow songs in the skinny house. Fuck it up to the tempo. tempo. Fuck it up. Fuck it up. Boyfriend watching. Oh, now you want to knuckle up. Get on this ride, baby. You don't have to book. There's always exceptions. In the case of something like the Langley School's music project, mm-hmm. it's classic rock. Yep. They're covering Beatles, Beach Boys, Fleetwood Mac. The publishing on every one of those tracks is owned by a huge company. We don't own the publishing. We own the recordings. Okay. Now, who's we? Well, that was interesting because these were found records. These were records that were pressed, I think, in maybe 300 copies and given away to a school district in Western Canada in 1976 and 1977. Who owns these recordings? I wanted to put them out. And nobody would claim ownership. There was a teacher, Hans Finger. He led the students, but he was an employee of the school. So he said, I don't own these. Uh, The school district, no contracts. They they didn't pay for anything. They didn't even know what these were. Now, uh, this is going back 25 years at the time. So they didn't claim they owned it. The students, there was like 260 students involved. And there was no record label because they were privately pressed. My lawyer and I had to put together a a contract really from scratch to figure out how we can do this legally so we don't get sued, so we're fair to everybody, so ethically it's sound, and our consciences will be free and clear knowing that we did the right thing. And we decided to split the royalties four ways. There was me, and it's an equal split of me, Hans Fanger, the teacher, mm-hmm. the school district, and the and the record label. It's four way split, and the publishing, of course, we don't control. Right, never did, which is a disadvantage because if people want to license the Langley School recording of Good Vibrations, or In My Room or Space Oddity, or Rhiannon, we can give them a license on a very reasonable rate, but they got to go to the publisher of those songs. Ah. And the publishers of those songs are never going to give anybody a reasonable rate. Those songs command high licensing fees. They want to come kill me. They want to come kill me. They want to come kill me because I walk around and I ask no question. They want to come kill me. They want to come kill me. They want to come kill me because I walk around and I ask no question. 
There was a girl from Dorset. She used to play a tune in a corset. But have you ever heard it? No. No, well, cock your ass, but don't ask no question. They want to come kill me. They want to come kill me. Um, but for the most part, with orphaned and abandoned uh, things and public domain things, there's a lot out there that you can you can um, work with. I, I'm a big fan of old Calypso. Okay. A lot of that old Calypso, I mean, the labels are gone. The, the artists are gone. There's no known heirs. I mean, these were maybe someone made one record in 1957. Uh, the label put out three records and then went out of business and nobody assumed ownership. But I like that record. And uh, being a big Calypso fan, I keep putting out these digital collections that I've remastered from vinyl. I do digital restoration. Well, I'm not going to find the owners of these recordings. I know that. I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. So uh, I put these out. And 99.9% .9 of them, never a question. It's just orphaned material. Every so often, someone will come out of the woodwork and say, I own that. Well, in the case, uh, there was an outsider. I'd found this record. It came out in 1982. I had no idea where these people were. I put the record on a digital compilation of songs in the key of Z. And after a month, I get an email from someone who claims that's my recording. My husband and I made that. And I realized, oh, she did. And she says, and I have a friend who's a lawyer. And that lawyer, my friend lawyer says, you committed infringement and we want $10,000. So I checked my bookkeeping. Uh, I had sold four downloads <laughs> for which I had gotten 70 cents a piece from iTunes. I had earned $2.80 on this. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, once I got that email, I quickly removed it from the digital release and replaced it with something else. So it's, it was on the market for a month. Four downloads were sold, and she's asking $10,000. Uh, I did infringe. I admitted it. I'm trying to be nice to this woman, but I'm not giving her $10,000. I checked with my attorney. He said, you're not liable for $10,000. He said, you're, if she ever took you to court, they're going to award her 100% of the revenue collected on that track, which was $2.80. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to insult her and offer her $2.80. Right. But I explained everything to her. And I think her lawyer friend eventually told her, yeah, you're really not going to have a case here. So take what he's willing to give you. I offered her $75 and I sent her $125. Aww. And that was it. Never heard from her again, and I won't go near that track again. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's rare. Was Sun Ra uh, an artist that you were into? How did that come to be? Because that seems to be like a big, huge undertaking. Am I correct? Let me put it this way. It's a big, huge undertaking. <laughs> okay. Let's just say it's not a job I sought out. Oh. Not a job I ever expected to have. It wasn't anything that was on my bingo card. It was nothing that was in my bucket list. Back in the 70s, I remember coming across this record, Space is the Place by Sun Ra. And I just thought, this record's crazy. This is, this, who's this guy? He's nuts. This is really just insane. Kind of liked the version of Rocket Number no. 9 on there, but the rest of it, I couldn't make head, head nor tail of it. I just thought, uh, my friends and I were like, this guy's nuts. In the 90s, the first Sun Ra albums began appearing on CD. And I didn't know any backstory to any of this. All I know is, wow, that guy who I thought was kind of crazy back in the 70s, now they're putting out all these records on CD, and I've, I've heard a few of them, and it's jazz. Oh, I get it. He's jazz. I don't remember hearing this stuff in the 70s. I remember hearing weird electronics and a strange band that sounded like it was half out of tune and he's wearing these odd costumes and what kind of name is Sun Ra. But in the, in the 90s, as Evidence was putting out all these CDs, which really were the first compact disc issues of these privately pressed Saturn records, people started hearing Sun Ra for the first time. And 
the sun, the Saturn records were so rare that most people never heard them. And even if you could find one, it was probably, you know, scratched to shit because those things got played. But evidence, God bless them, they decided that that stuff was worth preserving on CD. Again, I didn't know any of this at the time. All I know is, oh, here's all these Sun Ra records. And I'm listening to the CDs and they're not bad. They're kind of kind of cool. So I became a fan on a limited basis. I mean, as much as I knew Art Blakey and Lee Morgan and Miles Davis and Thelonious Monk and whatever, oh, just adding it to my, my uh, knowledge base of jazz that I liked and would play on the radio. I already knew a guy by the name of Michael Anderson, who is the tape custodian of most of Sun Ra's tapes. Michael lives in New Jersey. He's a friend of mine. I met him at WFMU in 1991 when he came down to do a show. He was a big Raymond Scott fan, so we found a bond over Raymond Scott. And Michael and I just hit it off. We're very different people. I mean, we couldn't be. We are night and day, literally. A certain sense of humor we both had, a certain aesthetic. We are actually both easy to get along with, even though people think we're both difficult human beings. Um, so Michael and I forged a bond. And he would tell me he had these Sun Ra tapes. I didn't know what that meant. It meant nothing to me. Even as I'm listening to the CDs, I'm not connecting Michael to these CDs. In the early 2000s, I started having Michael come on my show for Sun Ra's birthday, and he would play a bunch of Sun Ra music. And the more I heard, the more I thought, wow, this stuff's really interesting. And wow, that's never heard that before. And Michael would talk about it because Michael had played with Sun Ra. He was a percussionist in the 70s. He had lived in the house in Philadelphia and he had these tapes. I didn't know how he got them. He told me he was Sun Ra's tape librarian. I, I had to accept all that because I, I wasn't there when all this went down. And um, occasionally I'd go to visit him and I'd see all these tapes. And I'm just amazed at how many tapes he had. This went on for a number of years until 2013, when out of the blue, someone left a message at WFMU where Michael used to do a radio show, but he wasn't on the air anymore. But he had a lot of friends there. Um, someone left a message that Michael was in trouble and he needed help. And someone really got to check in on him. And that message was forwarded to me because I was closer to Michael than just about everybody else on the station. And I got in touch with Michael and I went to see him. And I hadn't seen him in years and he just looked bad. He looked malnourished. He was unhappy. He was depressed. Um, he was broke. And he started telling me that he was being ripped off, that people owed him money and they weren't paying it, that um, he was just really struggling. And it was, and he said the, the, the money that was owed to him by various people had to do with Sun Ra licenses that he had issued. I knew a lot about licensing at that point, but I didn't know much about Sun Ra. I, I loved Michael. Uh, and to me, I wanted to help him. So I organized a number of different ways uh, with WFMU to buy him groceries. We took up a donation to give him some money. People would call him and talk to him. And at some point in mid-2013, he said, this, this is like the, the, uh, the turning point of, of this whole story. Out of the blue, he says, I need a manager. Can you be my manager? And I'm like, what am I managing? I didn't know what that meant. I mean, I was managing the Raymond Scott estate and I'm managing es some Esquivel rights and Jim Flora and Langley and whatever else, but I'm not sure, Michael, what you want me to do. He wanted me to collect some money that he was due from various people that hadn't been paid. I said, I can try and do that. But that's when things started to get really weird. Hmm. Rocket number nine to go for the planet, to the planet. Venus, rocket number nine to go for the planet, to the planet. Venus, rocket number nine to go for the planet, to the planet. 
Minos, two, 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 up in the air, up, up, two, up, two, up in the air. Right around that time, someone mentioned to me that, oh, did you hear that Lady Gaga sampled Sun Ra on her new album? She had an album called Art Pop. It was a song called Venus. I didn't know that. And I asked Michael, did you issue a license for a Sun Ra sample on the Lady Gaga album? He says, no. Who did? He says, I don't know. So I looked into it, and it turned out that Lady Gaga had sampled a recording by a French group called Zombie Zombie okay. of Sun Ra's composition, Rocket Number no. 9. You got a recording, you got the publishing. Right. So there was publisher's license in that. There's not a recording. They, they licensed the recording from Zombie Zombie. No claim on that. That's a French band. But Rocket Number no. 9, that's a Sun Ra composition, and it's right. controlled by uh who michael who controls that he didn't know so i started looking into that and someone sent me a scan of the liner notes for the record art pop and it said rocket number nine by sun Ra, licensed from uh global copyright administration I asked michael michael who's gca he says, oh that's bernard bernard stolman founder of esp disc I said, so Bernard issued a license for Rocket Number Nine. So he's the publisher of Sun Ra. And Michael goes, no, he's not. Well, who is? Well, you'll have to talk to Sun Ra's family. So he puts me in touch with Sun Ra's family. It's Sun Ra LLC. The patriarch of the family is down in uh, Georgia, a guy named Thomas Jenkins Jr. He was Sun Ra's sisters. Only son. And I, I called him and I said, Did you license Rocket Number Nine to Lady Gaga? And he says, No. He says, Did you know that it was licensed? And he said, No. And he said, Well, this guy Bernard Stolman licensed it. And that started a conversation because he said, Bernard does not represent us. Bernard has never represented us. We have never signed a contract with Bernard. And for years, Bernard's been trying to claim Sun Ra's rights, but he doesn't own anything. I said, oh, that's interesting. At that point, I thought, there's probably some money at stake here. Uh -huh. Somebody's getting ripped off. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Sun Ra heirs sound like they're getting ripped off. Michael's getting ripped off. Bernie was one of the people Michael was complaining about, that he had done some work for Bernie and wasn't paid. So I started calling Bernie. Called Bernard Stolman a few times, asked him flat out, did you issue this license? What's the basis of your issuing this license? How much were you paid, et cetera, et cetera. And I called him four, four times. The first three times we talked for maybe a half hour each time. And it was quite disorienting. How so? I came away with the sense that Bernard was out of his mind, that there was something brilliant there, maybe even a touch of genius, but that he was out of his mind. He's a lawyer, but he has a reputation, I knew, for being a thief, being a predator, mm. being a bit of a pirate. I mean, there's a book about Bernard. It's, it's called Always in Trouble. And everything he told me didn't add up. I'd call him once and he would tell me he got a $25,000 advance. The next time I'd call, him, oh, I only got a $10,000 advance. And I'd call the third time, oh, it was only $5,000 and I haven't been paid yet. So it kept changing. The story kept changing. 
Finally, the fourth time I called him was the shortest conversation. I called Bernard. He picks up the phone. I said, Bernard, it's Irwin. He says, oh, what do you want? I'm under the call. It's got to be quick. What do you want? I said, Bernard, I just have one question for you. Okay, what is it? Make it quick. Bernard, who is the publisher for Sun Ra? And there was a pause. And he said, that's a complicated question. I'm really busy right now. I can't take it. You know, goodbye. And he hung up on me. Hmm. So the fact that he didn't say he was, he didn't say somebody else was. He said, it's a complicated question. Told me all I needed to know. And at that point, Bernard was in my crosshairs. I decided that there was a legitimate claim that Sunrise heirs could make because they were the publisher. I told them, I got this whole story about how they had a history with Bernard trying to claim Sun Ra's rights, but they, would, they didn't like him. They didn't trust him. They would never sign with him. And he just assumed ownership, mm. figuring that there are a bunch of people down in South I can take advantage of. They'll never come after me. So I'm just going to plunder the catalog and never have to pay them royalties. And that's what he did. Wow. And he did that for about 12 or 13 years. Holy cow. So I then told the heirs of Sun Ra, first of all, I had to determine they own the publishing. They also own the rights to Sun Ra's recordings. And they gave me a stack of documentation that I had to read through about all these court cases and the probate process after Sun Ra died without a will. And all these people who had challenged and lost in court and how they emerged victorious as the heirs. They were heirs, blood heir. They were the kin. Yeah. So there were heirs and there was an estate. The estate consisted of the rights, the publishing and the recordings. It went to the heirs, but they didn't know how to administer it. Mm -hmm. They were an easy target for someone like Bernard. Sure, sure. That's the last time I talked to Bernard and I told the family, I said, look, I'm going to represent you in this. I'm going after Bernard. I'm going to get your rights back and I'm going to pay the legal bills and I'm going to indemnify you. You don't have to pay the legal bills. I'm going to pay them. And I don't care how many thousands or tens of thousands of dollars I have to pay. I think we can win this. But if we lose, you don't owe me a nickel. It's my loss. I will pay the legal bills. And if we win, I want a very equitable split of the money that we get out of this. And I want Michael to be a part of that. Because Michael has been the custodian of Sun Ra's music for 30 years and he's right. broke without him those tapes might not exist he preserved them so from that point on uh there was about a one-year legal battle against bernard uh i had my attorneys and bernard had well bernard is an attorney yeah yeah and the lady gaga and interscope people had their attorney and their attorney was a total bulldog who mm. made life hell for me for a year all the while, I was aware that Bernard had no authority to issue that license. At one point, he was asked to prove that he owned the publishing on Rocket Number no. 9. And he sends a bunch of documents to the lawyer for Interscope, who sends them on to my lawyer, who sends them over to me. I've seen enough of these that I'm aware of what the rights issues are and what these contracts should say. So there's a two-page contract, page one, page two. And I'm looking at these. Again, they're on my computer screen. And the first thing I notice is the typewriter used for page two is different than the typewriter used for page one. The line spacing on page one is different than the line spacing on page two. The, oh my God. the last sentence on page one does not continue at the top of page two. It's a different sentence. Oh. The contract on page one is between Bernard Stolman and Sun Ra, but at the bottom of page two, there's eight signatures at the bottom. This is like a page one yeah. for one contract and a page, page two, two for a different contract. Correct. It doesn't say rocket number nine anywhere on there. It's like, and it's not a publishing agreement. Nor does it take a rocket scientist to determine that. <laughs> oh, anybody could have looked at this and said, wait a minute. Yeah. This, this makes no sense. So I realized that page one 
was page one from probably his original license for heliocentric worlds of Sun Ra, the first Sun Ra album on ESP in 65. Then there was Heliocentric Worlds Volume 2. So I think page two was the page two for that contract. So he sent me two half contracts. Yeah. But they had nothing to do with Rocket Number 9 because that wasn't on that record, either of them. And it didn't say that he was given the rights for any publishing. I thought, this is the basis of his claim? This is a slam dunk. There's nothing here that's of any substance whatsoever. And I have to explain this to the attorney for Interscope that this stuff, I mean, he always does look at it for two minutes and say, this is a bunch of crap. <laughs> so I had to write this, what amounted to a legal brief, explaining what the stuff was that Bernard gave us, what it all meant, and how irrelevant it was. And it didn't prove anything. Right. I wrote this whole thing. I give it to my lawyers. At this point, they're like, I'm writing the letters and they're then and adding the legal the, the, the legal tweaks that make it a legitimate legal letter from a law firm. So uh, I explained all this and then they would edit a little bit and add a couple of words here and there and add some Latin over here and add a <laughs> citation over here. Great. And there we go. Off it goes. Well, it became apparent after a while that the attorney for Interscope was telling us that we had to settle our case with Bernard and that once we worked that out, Interscope would decide who was the rightful owner of the license. I'm not a lawyer. Remember, I said, no, that's not how this works because Bernard issued a license that he had no authority to issue, but you put the record out. You're the one committing the infringement. Every time you sell a Lady Gaga record with that song on it, you're infringing. That's called rolling infringement, and you are committing it. So you have to go after Bernard. We don't have to go after Bernard. Wow. You have to pay us because we're the rights holders, and then you have to sue Bernard because he licensed something to you. He put you in trouble. He licensed something to you that he didn't own. So you go after him. So at some point, the lawyer for Interscope began to realize what was going on here, that Bernard was not going to settle with us and we weren't going to settle with, with him. So at that point, he decides that he's going to triangulate and work out an agreement between us, Interscope, and Lady Gaga's company, and Bernard. And they're drawing up like a 60 page, I mean, it's 38 pages, whatever. It's this long document. You know, it's a bunch of legal baloney that's got to be in there to make the whole thing legitimate. They, they're going back and forth, running up my legal bills. And I'm thinking like, well, it's down on paper now. Just got to get them signatures because it looks like this thing is finally going to be resolved. We're going to get the license and we're going to get the advance that they paid to Bernard. And then at the last minute, after like a year of this, the attorney for Interscope calls up my attorneys and says, um, Bernard's no longer talking to us. He said we have to talk to his attorney. What? At the last minute, we've negotiated everything, and now he says we have to talk to his attorney? And the attorney for Interscope said, yeah, I looked into Bernard's attorney, who he just brought in. She's not an entertainment business attorney. She doesn't know anything about Bernard's case. And I dug a little more deeply, and I found out that right after she graduated from law school, the first thing she did was she sued her law school. The lawyer for Interscope said, that's it. Bernard's out of here. We're no longer dealing with him. At that point, we changed some of the details of the license, the 38-page agreement. We signed. They signed. We were done. Then. I had to continue my fight with Bernard because mm. that was one song. That was rocket number nine. One usage on a Lady Gaga tune. What about Sun Ra's other 1,000 compositions that right. Bernard is claiming? That he's licensed with all these performing rights societies and foreign publishers and all over the world. I'm going to get all that back. Wow. I, I was, it was just an absolute impasse because Bernard would not relent. The Bernard you're stealing the money from these people. They, they're the rightful owners. You're not. And 
I couldn't get him to cooperate. And then finally, out of nowhere, I get a call from a guy who described himself as Bernard's last friend in the music business. And he said, Erwin, I just want you to know, Bernard is afraid of you. (laughs) And I said, why? And he said, because he's afraid you're going to sue him for money he doesn't have. And I said, well, we can resolve that very easily. All Bernard has to do is waive his claims on Sunrise music that he's been claiming, and I'll leave him alone. I'll, I'll, I'll go away. I mean, I'm not asking him for back royalties or anything. I just want him to just get the fuck out of the Sun Ra business, okay, once and for all, and put it on paper. He, and this guy said, I think Bernard will do that. So let me go back to Bernard. I'll ask him. I speak to the guy a few days later. He says, Bernard says, let's do it. We signed the agreement, got the signatures, and we were over and done. And then I was able to submit that. It was a relinquishment. He relinquished Sun Ra's rights. I had to send that letter everywhere and saying, Bernard is no longer the uh, the claimant. Sun Ra LLC is, and I represent them. That was in December 2014. In March 2015, Bernard died. Yeesh. So that's how the whole business happened. And during that year, we began a reissue program with iTunes, the Master for iTunes program. We signed uh, with a couple of record labels to start putting out new Sun Ra product and make it sound really good and get new liner notes and just clean up all these rights issues. There were still some outstanding legal issues that had to be resolved. But at that point, um, it could be a full-time job. But because I'm doing so many other things, it's a, it's a big part-time job. Sure. There's no way we all have a crystal ball and can foresee the future. My question is, I'm curious to know, is it, are you working with outsider artists today or recently? Because it sounds like there might be a, some estate planning that needs to be set up ahead of time for some of these outsider artists that are working today, you know, 15, 20 years down the road, there might be an opportunity. There might be something else we don't know. And are these artists set up so they don't get taken advantage of in the same way that Sun Ra did? Uh, Sun Ra was an outsider. First of all. Okay. Okay. Now an outsider musician is, is no diff. They're an artist. They're no different from any other artist. Anyone who has a catalog, and when I say catalog, a lot of compositions, a lot of recordings, paintings. If they don't want it simply to be orphaned, you need to put it in writing who it goes to when you die. And along with that comes the power of attorney in case you're disabled, a health directive, all these little things. I don't need to be an estate lawyer here, but these are the things that happen. The outsiders that I've dealt with, the let's use the term outsider to apply to dead or alive. There's only two that I represent. They're both deceased. One is Lucia Pamela. She made one record, one album. I control the master recordings and the publishing because she has family. And they they saw that I was the one who championed her music. And they said, okay, you can keep the rights to this. I mean, they own it, but I can administer it and It's mine. There's that. And the other is Shuby Taylor. But with Shuby Taylor, who did scatting over other people's recordings, he did some acapella scatting, and I own those recordings, but he never wrote a song in his life, so I don't control any publishing. Um, It's a very limited rights that I own. And I had a deal with Shuby, and then it was carried over to his son. Okay. So. In that sense, I could administer that. Everyone else on those albums, I really have no connection to, nor have any of them ever asked me for any advice on what they should do. Uh, That's not my job. Mm -hmm. I'm not an estate attorney. Right. Uh, I help them achieve a certain visibility. 
that, that's just general advice. You know, yeah, yeah. Get, get your paperwork in order as you're, you know, it looks like you might be dying. Uh, might not be a bad idea to visit an estate attorney and look into that sort of thing. And if you can't afford an estate attorney, look online and find a template, write it up, get it notarized, whatever. Erwin, I can't thank you enough. This has been awesome. Uh, Keith, thank you very much. All right. I'm hitting hey. leave. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Be sure to check out Erwin's radio show every Friday from noon to three on WFMU or WFMU.org. Many thanks to Erwin Chusid. The songs you heard during this podcast were Follow Me to San Jose by Eric Satin, which features a sample of Esquivel's Anna. Tempo by Lizzo, featuring Miss Elliott, which contains a sample of Nescafe by Raymond Scott. Ask No Questions by King Radio, The Lion, The Tiger, Gerald Clark, and his Caribbean Serenaders. And Rocket Number 9 by Sun Ra. With the exception of Ask No Questions, all of these songs are available to stream wherever you stream your favorite music. Please be sure to check out the episode notes. We'll have links there for all the stuff that you're probably scratching your head about now. Abandoned Albums was recorded at Thunder Love Studios. This episode was written and produced by me, Keith R. Higgins. Original music by Mike Pellegrino. Engineered and mixed by Steve Beasley. Edited by A.J. Royce. If you like what you've heard, please be sure to subscribe and leave us a rating. It really does help. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on social media. At Twitter, we are at Abandon Albums. And on Instagram, we are at Abandon underscore Albums. Many thanks to Ronnie Barnett, Bailey Leaf, Rob Janicki, S.W. Loudon, Michael Janicki, Steve Beasley, Mike Pellegrino, Therina Bella, Peyton Janicki, and of course, our executive producer, Rufus Thunderwolf. <laughs>